Open up to the book of Hebrews and let's get going. Let's get going. <clears throat> the book of Hebrews, um, congregations and, and really Sunday school teachers and Bible teachers say that, have always taught that this is written by Paul. All of my professors in seminary told me to speak definitely that Hebrews was not written by Paul. Um, there is no claim of authorship in this book. If you read the book of Hebrews, it does not claim anyone as the author. And every letter that Paul wrote, he was not ashamed to put his name to it. He was not ashamed to say, I, Paul, am writing this to the church in Rome. Uh, and this book does not bear any of that. And it, it does not follow his style of writing. So that's, that's why people say that. That's why my professors encourage me to teach it that way. Uh, as far as dating, it was probably written between the 60s and the 80s. Uh, the 80s is probably more likely after the temple was destroyed. Um, the temple is not really an important argument here, but the tabernacle is. So when you're studying Hebrews, you want to Think about the tabernacle and not the temple. And if you read it, the author talks about the, the tabernacle quite a bit. Uh, some people have a hard time outlining the book of Hebrews. Um, <clears throat> Daniel is the one that provided this one to me, and I think it's quite good. Um, the, the reason people have a hard time outlining it, it's not in a typical letter format, like a reading and then a body and then a... It doesn't exactly follow that, but here is, I think, a good way that we can break it up. So the author of this letter, whoever it is, the pastor, uh, who is giving this word of exhortation, wants to establish irrevocably that Jesus is superior, that he is greater than. Um, he kind of begins this way in, in a treaty, treatise format. Um, the sun has no rivals. The sun is superior to angels. The sun is superior to Moses. The sun is superior to all the Old Testament priesthood. He is greater than those. Um, <clears throat> he starts with the angels. If you go to chapter 1, he starts talking about that. And see, uh, at the first, there in verse 5, there's a citation from the Old Testament. You see, you are my son today. I have become your father. You see that? There are seven citations proving that Jesus was superior to angels. And as we have studied before, numbers are important, right? What's significant about number seven? It's a number of completion. Completion. Think of creation, perfection. So seven citations to show that Jesus is superior. Significant number seven. Um, God never said to any angel, you are my son. He never uh, said, I have begotten you. You are my son. Uh, and then the conclusion of all that, verse 14, uh, chapter 1, verse 14. Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who inherit salvation? The angels are sent to serve. And Jesus himself was a servant. But Jesus wasn't just a servant. He was a son. Uh, the son is a son. In light of who the son is, he, he is superior. And he gives us this exhortation in chapter 2. So let's read some of this in chapter 2. Go to verse, chapter 2. Let's start in verse 2. For if the message spoken by angels was binding, and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles, and gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will, continuing with his uh, idea the angels brought about a message, yes, but who is the only person who brought about salvation? Christ. Christ. He is superior. 
Um, there's another section uh, connecting us to how we should live like him there in 14 through 18. I'm not going to read it, but it's there on your slide. You can read it later. And then he goes on um, saying how the son is superior even to Moses. Remember Old Testament. Moses was it. He was the prophet of prophets. Um, he was the greatest example of who to follow. He was everyone's uh, ideal. And here, the author of Hebrews is saying, the son was even superior to him, to Moses. Chapter 3, verse 3, Jesus has been found worthy of greater honor than Moses, just as the builder of a house has greater honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. Moses was faithful as a servant in all God's house. Uh, verse 6, but Christ is faithful as a son over God's house. Um, and then he, uh, so he's kind of walking down memory lane. He reminds them of their struggle, the, the Israelites of their struggles. Um, and he he, um, he encourages the readers not to follow in the path that the Israelites did. So in 3.12, he says, See to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. Instead of doing that, instead of having a, uh, an unbelieving, sinful heart, he then, you see the, the chapter heading in chapter 4? A Sabbath rest for the people of God. He calls us to have that instead of a sinful, unbelieving heart. Um, verse 9 is where he says that. 4, 9. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from his own work, just as God did from his I don't think he means an eternal resting place, but an appreciation, a time to focus and appreciate the salvation of God, the rest that comes from that. So instead of having the unbelieving heart, having a believing heart that rests in the salvation of God. Moreover, I think this, these are great chapters in um, verses in chapter 4. Go to 12. 412, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Scripture is we should not only rest in that salvation but we should hold scripture as uh, superior and high and, and active and living so the son is superior to angels the son is superior to Moses and then he argues that the son is superior to other Old Testament leaders and prophets and that starts in at the end there of chapter 4. Jesus, the great high priest. Therefore, since we have a, a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize for our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us there, you know, he goes through that. <clears throat> chapter 5 he goes through how the high priest was selected that again going back to the tabernacle remember the high priest was the one who was selected and responsible for going into the holy of holies and offering the sacrifices to um, to God for the sins of the people for the holy year Christ is superior to that not only because he was God himself but he was a human who understood all of our trials and tribulations.
questions so far? I just had a comment. Yep. Um, <clears throat> let's see. I had in my notes um, uh, that this was um, a letter ex uh, explaining uh, about the Trinity because a lot of people were having uh, uh, questions, questions or couldn't understand and so Hebrews was uh, to clarify give more definition to the Trinity God the Father God the Son and God, God the Holy, Holy Spirit, Spirit. Mm -hmm. and especially uh, for um, Hebrews or Jews that were Jews were Christians and were going back to Judaism because they couldn't understand and so he was clarifying them to them so they wouldn't be going back and forth, back and forth. Absolutely. Yes, I agree to that. Uh, and you can, you can see his point with the Trinity, why he's trying to prove the superiority of Jesus. Uh, in the Trinity, God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit are not in a higher, high, hierarchy. They are one points to the other. So God the Father is not superior to God, the to Son. Jesus the Son. Yeah, you get it. So, uh, yes, this is a very good book for that. And yes, it, it is written, I think, specifically for Jews, for Christian Jews. Uh, a note about the Melchizedek in chapter 5. Um, it talks about uh, Melchizedek. Uh, the story from Genesis 14, if you remember, um, there's no lineage given for Melchizedek. He blessed Abraham. He served the Lord Most High. And then Abraham gave a tenth to him, if you remember that story. So the author here of Hebrews is comparing Jesus to Melchizedek. That's what happens. You see it in verse 6. Um, Uh, he says that, that Jesus is of the same order. He's a priest of God. But Jesus is superior to him because Jesus is not a temporary one. He is a permanent high priest for us. Uh, he is an eternal priest on our behalf. So that's the, a lot of people get hung up on this, on the Melchizedek thing. Um, I really don't think it's, I think he's proving that Jesus is, beyond, above, greater than. And he says that there's no longer a need for these numerous priests. Jesus was undefiled, you know, without sin, we read that, uh, and he was a sacrifice once and for all. So there's no longer a need for all of these uh, in the Jewish tradition, the high priests, the sacrifices, all of that. Let's skip to, oh, in chapter 7, if you look at the chapter heading, talks a lot about Melchizedek, verse 11, starts with Jesus, how Jesus was like him. So verse 8, uh, chapter 8 is what I wanted to um, get to next. Let's read a chunk of this, because it talks about the new covenant, which is really good. Okay, verse 1, the point of what we are saying is this, we do not have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. Excuse me, we do have such a high priest. Um, verse 2, And who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by man. Every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Remember, we just talked about that. And so it was necessary for this one, Jesus, also to have something to offer. If he were on earth, he would not be a priest, for there were already men who offer the gifts prescribed by the law. They serve at a sanctuary that is a copy and shadow of what is in heaven. Okay, talking about the tabernacle. This is why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle. See to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. Verse 6, but the ministry Jesus had received is superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is mediator is superior to the old one. And it is founded on better promises. That's a very important verse. I hope you underline it. Verse 6, <clears throat> he is taking the tabernacle that, that God instructed Moses to build. 
and the premise of why it was built and saying that Jesus is superior to that. Why? Because the ministry of Jesus was superior and because the covenant of Jesus is superior to the old covenant. You see that in this verse? Uh, and then verse 7, for if there had been nothing wrong with that first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. But God found fault with the people and said, you know, da-da-da, skip down to verse 13. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete. And what is obsolete and aging will soon disappear. What was the first covenant, do you remember, from Exodus 19? If you obey these commands and uh, follow my laws, you know, I'm paraphrasing here, then you will be for me a kingdom of priests, a holy people, my chosen you. Yeah. That is what it says that God, uh, for if there had been nothing wrong with the first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. What was wrong with the first covenant? What was wrong with the first covenant? Man. The people didn't keep their No word. one could keep it. Right. The people could not keep it. And the whole Old Testament, what we studied, as, as much as they tried, the, the Israelites were incapable of ever keeping covenant. So God had to do something else. He had to make a new covenant. Raquel. Yes. The Jewish uh, faith no longer does sacrifices because they, they don't have, have the temple. temple. So if the temple was ever rebuilt, would they begin uh, the animal sacrifices again? I believe that if the temple were rebuilt, that they will. Okay. But they also, they I, I don't think they would ever start sacrifices again unless the temple was rebuilt exactly according to instructions and that would that would really there's they don't know where the ark is oh that's right so okay. they're they i don't think they would ever re start doing sacrifices without that piece okay i mean there's a lot of people <laughs> that think they know where it is but you can't dig there because because of the mosque yeah so I don't think they ever will because of that. Because I don't think they ever would start everything without having it really complete. And you can't have it complete without the ark. Unless they built a new one, but then, you know, you, yeah, you can't put the, it's the a Ten copy. Commandments in it. Yeah. It's it wouldn't a work. Copy. Jews of Jews would not do that. Very good comment. Uh, okay, so still talking about the New Covenant. Go to 11. Let's read this one more section. It's 10 o'clock. I want to get to Revelation. So we're going to speed it up. Um, chapter 9, verse 11. When Christ came as high priest of the good things that are already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not man-made, that is to say, not part of his creation. Verse 12. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of their heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. Verse 14, how much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our conscious, cons conscious. consciences conscious. From acts that lead to death, so that we may serve the living God. Verse 15. For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant, that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. Do you see the shift? Yep. This is why we are a New Testament church, the new covenant. No longer the tabernacle, no longer those. Christ is superior in that he has brought us a new covenant. Um, and when, when he says the old covenant is obsolete, that doesn't mean we, you know, we go and break the Ten Commandments. Paul himself said, uh, This is our foundation. Yeah, he's, he, 
Paul himself said that we should continue to keep it. But now we have this new covenant with the blood of Christ who covers our sins, who covers the transgressions of our Ten, you know, ten Commandment breaking. Um, so all that. So you can. I'm going to let you read this at home. Let's keep moving. Uh, faith comes into play in the book of Hebrews. If you've never read Hebrews 11, it's called the Hall of Faith, and it's a fabulous chapter. It goes through a lot of our heroes of faith from the Old Testament and uh, shows how they um, faith played out in their lives, in their lives and in their um, journey with God. Um, okay. Any other questions about Hebrews? Very quickly. We're going to go through James very quickly. <clears throat> Such a good book, the book of James. Uh, <clears throat> James is the author of James. Surprise. <laughs> but who? What James? Brother, brother, the, the brother of... Says 1-1. One, one. James, a servant of God and... Of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, it doesn't say brother. Okay. Mm -mm. He's the brother. Um, the brother of Jesus was called James. Yes? Yes. So he's the brother of Jesus. He's also mentioned in Mark chapter 6, verse 3. Um, I thought I had more notes on who he was. Okay, my Bible says. What does it say? Uh, James, uh, of the four men bearing the name James in the New Testament, only two have been proposed as the author of this letter: James, the son of Deb Zebedee, Zebedee, and the brother of John, and James, the half brother Jesus of Jesus. It's unlikely that the son of Deb Zebedee was the author, for he was martyred in A.D. 44. Okay, and that's an Acts 12 too. I, my notes say that this James was probably martyred in 62. Well, Josephus was an ancient writer and wrote that. Yeah. But this was written, obviously, before he was martyred. Luther, Mark Luther, did not like this book. <clears throat> you know that, right? Mark Luther wanted to rip this book out of his Bible. I think he did. He really did not like this book. Why? I don't know. You don't it's know? It's a very practical I've book. Never heard that. You've never heard that? No. no. Why did Luther start the Reformation? Uh, I'm talking about the split from, from Catholicism. We were all, we all no, used to be Catholic. Okay, so the book of James is a works faith book. It talks about the, impo the importance of works. Remember? Works without faith is dead. Martin Luther did not believe that. He wanted to throw this book out. Tough luck him. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's so practical. But it is so practical. I, I happen to love this book, but it is a point of con uh, contention. Uh, if Paul is everything to Martin Luther, James is nothing to him. Um, it's a call to works righteousness. Um, many people believe that the book of James is one of the earliest, uh, perhaps the earliest New Testament writing that we have. The language is very similar to the Gospels, even. So, um, the dating, really, if James was martyred in A.D. 62, which is what my notes have, the book was written much earlier, so really could have been written right when the, the Gospels themselves were written. It is addressed to the 12, see in verse 1, to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. That's a Jewish way of saying it. To the twelve tribes, it's a it's a red letter to Jewish Christians. To Jewish Christians, here's a brief outline. They're scattered all over the world. They're scattered everywhere. <coughs> the book of James is not really a book of how to become a Christian, but how to act like one. Right. What happens in the life of a Christian? What should a Christian do? Change their ways. Change change your mind. I am so far. Um. He says that it doesn't suffice for you to believe in God. Because why? Even the demons believe in God. You have to go beyond that. You have to go uh, beyond that in how to, you live your life. So open to the book of James if you're not there. Let me read some of it because it's so good. Uh, go to 19. 
My dear brothers, my dear sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. For man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. 22. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. Can you, can you, I mean, do, do, do you see, yeah, do you see what he's saying? I mean, do we, do we wake up and look at ourselves in the mirror and then when we turn away, are we even capable of forgetting what we look like? No, no, not usually. And he is saying, if, if all you do is listen to it, but you don't practice it, that's what you're doing. That's, he's comparing it to that. 25. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. If anyone considers himself religious and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself, and his religious is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. One of my favorite passages here from uh, the book of James. Genuine religion, according to God, is that you actually do what it says, that you that you do not just listen. And he says, if we do that, we are deceiving ourselves and we, we become liars. True religion that God desires is that we act upon the principles that we're listening to. Um, genuine faith. Um, he talks about how faith is not skewed by favoritism. That talks about it, that in chapter 2. Uh, and then here's, okay, here's the passage. Chapter 2, verse 14. What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, it, if it is not accomplished by action, is dead. Um, he considers faith without works to be dead. What kind of actions is he speaking about? What kind of works is he speaking about? Taking care of, the, of those less fortunate than you, for one. Okay. So, so he's not talking about. It's hard to tell a tell a a person that's hungry and cold to become a Christian without first feeding him, giving him more clothes so he can understand. Okay, so here's, okay, uh, peanuts. Uh, Snoopy looks kind of cold, doesn't he? I'll say he does. Maybe we better go over and comfort him. Be of good cheer, Snoopy. Yes, be of good cheer. I think that's, that's, you know, if we're like that, if we're acting religious and saying, oh, be of good cheer, but we, we do nothing to actually be a person of compassion that accompanies our faith, then it is nothing. Uh, if we don't acknowledge the basic um, things that you need in life, then it's hard to, um, for them to me, show me. I think you can read this slide at home. I want to talk about chapter 4, which is, I think, the best chapter of this whole book. Um, I think this, I think this is read a lot, 
but I think the message of it is neglected a lot by the church. Uh, what cause, chapter 4, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't, don't they come from the desires that battle within you? Um, he keeps going. Uh, you kill, you covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. Verse 4, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred towards God? Um, so he goes on and on. Talking about the way that the world, the way that we live in the world is quite selfish. Seeking your own pleasures. And I think in today's society, we live in this kind of world where it's all about us and we can have whatever we want. Um, uh, he talks more in verse 11. Uh, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against his brother or judges him, when you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting on judgment on it. I, I think everything he's talking about is... Um, living in such a way that is inward looking and selfish and, and seeking what you want. But his message is so perfect. It's what we should do instead. Verse 7, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter into mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. These, these three commands, submit then to God. Um, come near to God, he will come near to you. And then humble yourselves before the Lord. If anything, the message of the book of James, even forgetting the, the works salvation issue, if you remember that the book of James calls us to a changed life instead of looking inwardly to our own wants and our pleasures and what we covet, what we want. To do those things instead. To submit to God, to come near to Him, and to be humble uh, towards, towards life, towards each other, towards everything. I think that's the most important message that the author, James, could ever give us. I think it's so, so important. I think the non-believers who do know Scripture to use it against Christians cameras over the head with this book. I think you're right. <laughs> yeah. You know, and uh, you hypocrites. Yeah. Right. So this is this is I've always felt that this is the book that we get hammered on. Yeah. Yeah. And um, if you ever do have a, a, a friend that is not a believer that asks you what book should I read from the Bible, do not tell them James. Mm -hmm. Tell them the book of the Gospel of John. Tell them something. But James is um, again not a book on how to become a Christian, but how to truthfully um, and genuinely live as one. I think it's very applicable for us. But I think that it, someone who is not a Christian yet would struggle with this book because it's. Um, I, I think it would be hard to understand if I was not a believer. I think it would confuse me. Okay. Jude, very quickly. Sorry, I have to find the broken part of my Bible that has the book of Jude. Here it is. Authorship and background. Uh, there, the dating is virtually impossible to tell. It's recorded as Jude. The brother of James. James had a brother named Jude, and Jesus had a brother named Jude. So maybe they're all in the same family, the James, the Jesus, and the Jude. We don't know. We can only assume. Um, it's, it's written as an apocalyptic writing, and we're going to talk about this in a minute when we talk about the book of Revelation. It gives warning to various readers of impending dangers in their midst and calling them to action. There's an outline. There's only one chapter, so these are just verses. Again, the dangers of false teachers. So many false teachers in their day. The duty to fight for God's truth. And then there's a doxology. Um, let me read just a few verses that I think are good. Uh, verse 21. <clears throat> Keep your 
yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you eternal life, the response of how a Christian should be kept within God's love. And then um, the beautiful doxology that the book of Jude gives us, in chapter, uh, verse 24, to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. A beautiful way to end your day if, you're, if you have your Bible by your bed and you want to use this as a prayer at night. He is the one who is able to keep, to keep us. Okay. New PowerPoint. Let me switch. Are you ready for this? Yeah, you deep down into it. Deep down into it? Answer all the questions I've always had. Uh -huh. uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. thought that this was himself the Apostle John. John was a very common name at the time, uh, but we have to go with early church tradition and what it says here, that he was a prophet of prophets, that he was a servant of God, and that the early Christians did believe he was the Apostle John himself. Um, okay, written probably around 92 to 96 AD, so really the last, the last book here. Uh, written during the final days of Emperor Domitian, who reigned from 81 to 96 AD. Under his rule, this Roman emperor, Christians were persecuted in various areas, accused of being <coughs> irreligious to the public cult and antisocial to the norms of their day. Um, it is a very hard book to teach, to understand. It is the, some of the poorest Greek of the New Testament. It's really not, not really well written if you're looking at the Greek language. Um, and we're going to talk. We're going to talk about a lot of it. I, I hope we really actually understand this. Okay, who is it written to? Seven verse four, chapter one, verse four, to the seven churches in the province of Asia. So here's. Um, a map of the seven churches and if you'll go to the first handout I gave you the colored packet um, uh, <clears throat> here's the list on the first page is the list of those seven churches you see that and it kind of gives you a brief little explanation so that's for you to read more at home if you flip the page, oh, there's more about the seven churches. Oh, it even gives you their strengths, their faults, the instruction that Revelation gave to them, and their promise. That's 108, see? And then there's a fabulous map, page 109, the third page I gave you. See that? Much better than the map that I have up here. That's where these churches were. And see how they kind of make a, a semicircle or a circle? 
So it was said that these these letter the, the letter of Revelation circulated among them. Okay? Because remember, not multiple copies at the time, so it kind of went in a circle. So they're located in ancient Asia Minor. This is modern day Western Turkey. Um, it is primarily a word on target to these people. And then and only then in an extension to us. But it says it was written to them first. Okay? Um, it is best read in the light of the times in which it was written. So, uh, what did he say? 81 to 86? What did I say? 90? 92 to 96. That's when it was written, and it is best read in light of those times and what was happening then. Okay, so why did he write it? Why do you think he wrote it? Encouragement, maybe? Or hope? No warning. Was he commanded? Be because what? Because he was commanded. He, uh, yeah, I think he received this vision and he, I think he was commanded to write it down. So, um, your book, your homework book, on page 210 says this. John wrote the revelation to remind suffering believers of the sovereignty of God and the redeeming work of Christ. This is verbatim from your book to provide hope for believers in Asia Minor. Uh, he emphasized the completion of God's plan of redemption at the return of Christ. Visions and symbols of the revelation provide encouragement and hope for all generation of believers. They remind us that the resurrected Lord Jesus is carrying out God's plan and will return to judge and rule the earth in righteousness. So that was from your homework book to page 210. Um, Let's talk about this real quick, the genre of, of this book. So we, in the New Testament, we've studied the Gospels, which were kind of like a biography of Jesus in a way. It went through his life. And then we read letters. Um, so what, what does this fall into, Revelation? Prophecy? Okay. Yeah, uh, there's no, I'm not saying that. Um, Revelation is still a letter. We just talked about how it was written to these, um, these seven churches. Indeed, there are letters within this book, um, and it starts like a letter, exactly like the other letters started. Um, and it closes like a letter. Um, but in the lines and within this letter, there are other literary features that are operative and are at play and are very important. It is not only a letter, but like Laura said, it, is, uh, it falls within the prophecy genre. It is a proclaimed word by a prophet to a people. Um, some other things to note is uh, there's a lot of Old Testament references, but they are never cited, like, uh, specifically. They're not in quote marks. He just says them. Remember, I told you really bad Greek here? No quote marks. He just kind of says, says them like that. Um, so, okay, the other genre that dominates it is the apocalyptic. That's the last one right there. A revealing, unveiling of that which was concealed usually involves a belief in the end times. Other thing from this packet, the last page of it, page 112 on the packet, is kind of a, like a glossary of some of the things. I thought this was really helpful. So, it talks about those numbers, what the Antichrist might be, Armageddon, eschatology, it kind of defines those terms for me. So in this prophecy apocalyptic genre, this is where John wants to open um, 
know how to explain this. I really apologize. I've never taught Revelation before. It's always so much fun. Oh, yeah. Okay, so going back to the time where this was written, the society there, Rome was everything. My notes here say there was Rome, Roman media everywhere. Coins, inscriptions, everywhere you knew, Rome was in charge. Rome was the rule. Revelation says that the, the message says that as ultimate as you may think that Roman that, that the Romans have rule, that they are in control, that they are in charge, they are not the ultimate. That is some of his message to these churches. Uh, any human rule may be taking over your life and controlling your life right now, but it is not permanent. Do you, does that make sense? Yes. I'm trying to make sense of it in my head. The problem with the Roman rule at the time was that it was perverted. As, as any, you know, government or, or um, um, national uh, control that we may have is perverted. But that something else is coming. That the good rule is coming. And that's where at the end it talks about a new heaven and a new earth. But I wanted to mention that about Rome first. Okay, everybody with me? Mm -hmm. So far? We're not confused yet? Okay. So here's an outline of the whole book. And <clears throat> before we can even talk about how to interpret the book of Revelation, I want us to kind of walk through it and see what's actually in there. Because, you know, people have really strong opinions of the book of Revelation and how they think it's the right way to interpret it. But, but my experience is that people actually have no idea what's in this book. So I want us to walk through it first and kind of see what it says, even though we might not understand it. And then at the end, I'm going to tell you, these are the ways some people interpret it. It is your choice on how to interpret it. So let's go through this outline and go through the book. So have it open, and we're going to talk about these. Um, I'll get to that. I don't know why. I'm okay. Well, I'm, I'm lost. I lost you. I, forgot, I didn't know where we were. Well, but then I'm old and crazy. Gotcha. Now. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Me, not you. <clears throat> so let's go back to chapter 1. 1-1. One, one. So an angel revealed to John these things, and he wrote them down and sent them to the seven churches. Let's go to verse... Chapter 1, verse 9. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Verse 10. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, Write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches. So you see why he wrote it, right there. He was on the island of Patmos, serving the Lord, being a prophet of prophets, everything that he said he was. And he heard a loud voice like a trumpet. He was in the spirit, he said. And he was told to write them down and send them to the churches. That is how it begins, yes? yes. Again with the number seven. Seven is the number of creation, the number of completion, the number of perfection. This is where this comes in. The, what Laura just had. So I'm going to start reading there from day three, the first part. Revelation contains four basic visions that portray God at work in the world. Do you see that? John opens his prophecy with a pictured picture of the glorified Christ strengthening churches that face persecution. John saw a vision of Christ that he used to encourage the seven churches of Asia as they face persecution. 
If you read through chapter 1, he sees a vision of Christ uh, among seven lampstands, and within his hands are stars. If you read it, that's kind of what it says. And there's, uh, eventually I have lots of pictures of what people think this looks like, and there's one, so I'll show you later. So that's his vision of Christ. Um, keep going here. John's second version shows divine judgment on the world of sin. In this section, John describes the sequence, sequences of judgment known as seals, trumpets, and bowls in order to show God's work in pouring out wrath and affliction to the world. We're going to go through all of that, the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls. His third vision pictured the victory of Christ over evil. In this section, John saw the destruction of a secular civilization, the return of Christ in glorious victory, and the millennium reign of Christ. Okay? So, everybody with me? So there's the first vision is the vision of Christ. They are standing with the seven lampstands and the letter to the churches. The, section, the second section is the vision of the 777, the, the, bowl, the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls. The third one is of this victorious return of Christ, the millennial reign. In John's final vision, the apostle pictured Christ in triumph over the ages. Here John portrayed a symbolic picture of heaven with God the Father and Jesus Christ the Son shown in triumph and victory. This vision would inspire hope and encouragement for believers. I printed this out for you, even though it's in your homework book, because I thought it was a really good major outline. I mean, if you're looking for major outlines, this is it. Kind of gives you a picture of the four visions. And that's the book of Revelation. We're going to go more into it. I wanted to show you that. Oh, here's the picture. Isn't that kind of creepy? Yeah. People have really undertaken to read these word for word and try to, you know, artists have tried to draw what they may look like. So John writes, and it's crazy language. Crazy language. If you go home and read it, it's really odd. It sounds odd, okay? It's all symbolic. Uh, so people might have undergone to, to draw these things, and, and later we'll see pictures of, of what the, the dragon with the seven heads might have looked like. But it's symbolic. So there probably will never actually be a dragon with seven heads. But the dragon may be a sim symbolism of an event or a person. And the seven heads may be symbolic of seven events or seven, you know, whatever. Or there might be a dragon with seven heads. We don't know. Like nobody knows exactly what this means. Um, but it, um, it, it looks really cool when you try to draw it out. And it leads to a lot of um, people spending a lot of their faith and time trying to understand what those things mean because they were symbolic. The first three chapters are the letters to the seven churches. Uh, the message of the letters are to first identify Jesus with these odd features, these um, stars in his head and uh, the lampstands and all this. Uh, he adds a word of commendation, of praise, of warning, and of promise. And that's what you see this awesome chart, page 108, gives the things that each letter said to each of the churches. That's in the first three chapters. It should be noted that the church of uh, Laodicea received no praise and that the church of Philadelphia received no rebuke. Um, the seven churches represent typical churches and typical needs of the first century church. Um, I believe that these, the words to these churches are relevant to churches in our century also. Uh, the pictures are very vivid of what God can do in judging a disobedient church and in strengthening a church who has committed Christians. So that's the first three chapters. Any questions?
If you have a question, I will probably not know the answer. But you can ask it. We can discuss it together. Chapter 4 begins with God on his throne. Okay? The throne in heaven. It's answering the question of who is in charge of the world. Chapter 4 is. Okay? Who, who's in charge of the world? God is. And that's, that's what he says. Let's read chapter 4. Uh, verse 6. Verse 6 is kind of broken up. It says, um, I'm going to start with in the center around the throne. You see that? In the center around the throne were four living creatures, and they were, and they were covered with eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second like an ox, the third had a face like a man, the fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered uh, with eyes all around, even under the wings. Day and night they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by you they were created and have their being. Who is in charge of the world? God is. God is. And even though Rome may be in control of your life, who is permanently in control? God, God, God controls is. Rome. Yes. That's chapter 4. Everybody still with me? Not confused yet? Okay. Yeah, Not. <laughs> 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 so, so chapter 4, the question it's trying to answer is... If God is in control, we've determined that in chapter 4, who will carry out God's will? Who will carry out God's will? Let's read. Who? That's, I think that's the question he's asking. Who will carry out God's will in history? So let's read chapter 5, verse 1. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll and look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. Who is able to open the scroll? Jesus. He is worthy. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Jesus is the one. Chapter 4. God is in control. Chapter 5, who is able to control the will of God through history? Who is worthy? Jesus. Jesus. He is the one who is able to open the seal, uh, the scroll, and the seven seals. Um, so now what happens in the book of Revelation, if we're not confused yet, we as readers get first row seats to the opening of the scroll and the seven seals. And that's what he does. He writes out what happens when the lamb opes up, opens up the scroll and the seven seals. Okay? So that's go to chapter 6. Here's an example of what he says. Um, 6 verse 1. I watched as the lamb opened the first of the seven seals. Then I heard one of the four living creatures say in a loud voice like a thunder, Come! I looked, and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow, and he was given a crown, and he rode out as a conqueror bent on a conquest. So that's the opening of the first seal. I gave you, the last thing I gave you that we haven't looked at yet, is a series of charts, and they're just black and white. And I got this straight out of a website. 
And it didn't, it didn't say don't reproduce it, so I did. But I, I, I left the website on there in case they come after me we're, one day. We're not telling. We don't, we don't know. I thought it was a really good basic little outline here. Of the seven seals, it's got the scripture reference and it has basically what it says. Um, again, crazy language. Look at, the, look at the chart. The first seal, the white horse. Um, the second seal was a red horse. He takes peace from the earth with a great sword. And, and you can read all those uh, later, but this is really what it says. Um, sorry, I'm still working it out in my head. Okay, so the scroll, the scroll and the seven seals contain the revelation I think of God's plan through history. And these seals, though confusing to us, make sense within the grand scheme of this apocalyptic end times idea. Okay? So we can't understand them because to us a white horse, a red horse, and a black horse make no sense. But they're symbolic of something else. Okay? Everybody still kind of with me? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The first four seals represent the spirit of conquest, war, famine, and death. The fifth seal gives a vision uh, for the safety of God's people in his presence. Uh, the sixth seal is a vision of terrible judgment, terrible divine judgment at the conclusion of all ages. The great earthquake, the sun, the moon, the blood, the stars of heaven fall. Um, before the seventh seal, though, there's this whole chapter, a pause from the opening of the seals. Chapter 7, before the seventh seal, contains the mention of 144,000 who would be preserved during the coming of times of trouble. Has anyone ever heard a um, speculation on what this number is? Probably, maybe. Yes, no. Is it Jews? It would be. Yeah, there's a lot of talk about the Jews. Okay. Between the two. So this is what. Well, this is what the scriptures say, right? That's in chapter seven. Find my spot. There's a lot of speculation on what these numbers could mean. There's no way to know. Your book actually gives several possibilities. Your homework book on page 217 and 218, it talks about a lot of the major theories of what the, the number could have been. Uh, one of the main things is the importance of, of numbers in the Bible, not only the number 3, not only the number 7, uh, the number 12 was very important, the 12 tribes. Um, and how, uh, you know, 144,000 being a multiple, all that. Chapter 7 happens, 144,000. Uh, the Lamb does not open the seventh seal until after that. Chapter 8, he opens the seventh seal. And what is the seventh seal? There was silence in heaven. heaven. Okay. Let's, let, uh, let's read a bit more. Let, let's just read um, 8, verse 1. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Verse 2. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. So after he opens the seventh seal, he sees a vision of seven angels holding seven trumpets. So that introduces the seven trumpets, which is the next thing. Your chart has the seven trumpets. You see that? Here we go again. At the beginning of each trumpet, these are called trumpet judgments. Okay? At the beginning of each trumpet judgment, an angel stepped forward, sounded the trumpet, and revealed something. So let's see. Uh, chapter 8, verse 6 says, then the, seven, then the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to sound them. Verse 7, the first angel sounded his trumpet, and there came hail and fire mixed with blood, and it was hurled down upon the earth. 
A third of the earth was burned up, a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. The first trumpet. Hail and fire mingled with, you know, the burning up of earth. Um, okay, so if you go through all the trumpets, the first four affected the earth and the heavenly bodies. They bring destruction, like we just read, to the vegetation, the oceans, that kind of thing. The first four bring kind of uh, effect, bring destruction. Trumpet five and six afflict men with pain and torture. Five and six. The seventh trumpet uh, kind of introduces a period to the end of times. And if you really read these, the imagery is amazing. Everybody still with me? So that, this, the opening of the sounding of the trumpets goes on through chapter 9, and then we get to chapter 10. Okay, here's some of the pic crazy pictures I got. From, can y'all see that? It's on your PowerPoint too. Chapter 10, verse 1 says, Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven. He was robed in a cloud with a rainbow above his head. His face was like the sun, and his legs were like the fiery pillars. He was holding a little scroll, which lay open in his hand. He planted his right foot on the sea, and his left foot on the land. And he gave a loud shout like the roar of a lion. When he shouted, the voices of the seven thunders spoke. Again, oh, so many numbers. And when the seven thunders spoke, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven say, Seal up the seven thunders, seal up what the seven thunders have said, and do not write it down. So we don't have that, because he didn't write it down. Again, an interesting picture of what this little dream vision could have looked like. I believe that each of these things actually means something else, that it's symbolic, that this angel, although he could one day exist and come down this way, that the, where his feet are stepping, what is on his head, the rainbow, everything is symbolic of perhaps something else. Um, what is that, you may ask? I have no idea. But um, the imagery, remember, he is receiving these visions. John is receiving these visions through a dream. He is writing them down. Apparently, he's not writing stuff down that he's told not to. Um, I don't have the interpretation for these. <laughs> I'm just showing you what's in there. Chapter 11. I was given a reed like a measuring rod and was told, go and measure the temple of God and the altar and count the worshipers there. Um, verse 4 says, these are two... Uh, there are two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. If anyone tries to harm them, fire comes from their mouths and devours their enemies. On and on. Just showing you some of the stuff. Again, there was this interlude before the seventh trumpet. And then the seventh trumpet came in chapter 11, the end of chapter 11. And it really was kind of an introduction to the end times. Chapter 12 is about the woman and the dragon. And let's read this briefly. Uh, chapter 12. A great and wondrous sign. Oh my gosh, is it 1050? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but we're not paying attention. Are y'all okay? Mm -hmm. A great and wondrous sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain, and she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his head. Oh, man. His tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them on the earth. Do you see this? The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that he might devour her child at the moment it was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who was to rule all nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne, the woman fled into the desert to take a place prepared to her by God. Here's a picture of what this could have been looked like. Could have looked like. 
Our book, our homework book, says that this vision of the woman and the dragon shows a perpetual conflict between God and Satan and God's people. This perpetual trouble. Uh, the vision reminds believers that Christ has defeated Satan and that commitment to Christ brings, brings victory over satanic temptation and harassment, verbatim from our book. Chapter 13 talks about these beasts. Uh, page 219 of your homework book describes these a little bit more, uh, explains these in more detail. There's this dragon with the seven heads, there's a sea beast, and there's a land beast, and this is what the interpretation is um, mostly, the, the antichrist, the false prophet, and your definition page talks about these some more. So this is uh, Satan's mirror to God's trinity? I had never thought about that. I bet people do interpret it that way. I don't know. I have not spent a lot of time trying to interpret it, so I don't really know. Chapter 14 talks again about the 144,000. Um, go to chapter 15. The seven angels with the seven plagues. I saw in heaven another great and marvelous sign. Seven angels with seven last plagues. Last because with them God's wrath is completed. And I saw what looked like a sea of glass mixed with fire. And standing beside the sea, those who had been victorious over the beast and his image and over the number of his name, they held harps given them by God and sang the song of Moses. Okay, verse 5. After this I looked, and in heaven the temple that is, the tabernacle of the testimony, was opened. Out of the temple came the seven angels with the seven plagues. They were dressed in clean, shining linen and wore golden sashes around their chest. Uh, then one of the four living creatures gave the seven angels seven golden bowls. Here's a picture of this image. The seven angels with the seven bowls. Huh? I was, I was confused. Yeah. So, uh, what, what is in the bowls is in the last, the last page of the chart. The bowls and the, see that? Mm -hmm. What is in the seven bowls? I'm going to keep moving so we can actually. Uh, chapter 17 and 18 talk about the prostitute and the beast. You can go home and have fun with that later. <laughs> chapter 19, um, the beast and the false prophet are cast into a lake of burning sulfur. Chapter 20 is the one that talks about the, the, uh, th the thousand years, and this is what is called the millennium, okay? That's what people always talk about. At the conclusion of the millennial period, okay, so in the thousand years, Satan is bound, what this verse says. He seized the dragon and bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed him over it. At the conclusion of the thousand years, Satan is released to cause an additional period of chaos upon the earth. Uh, later, he will be defeated and cast into the lake of fire. But at, this, at the end of the thousand years, he will be released. Um, page 221 of our homework book gives an idea of why he might be released. I thought it was pretty interesting. He says, the ability of Satan to cause trouble on earth after the period of perfect peace makes clear that the ultimate cause of sin in the human heart is in the human heart and not merely in social conditions and environment. To show that sin is personal, not merely social in nature or origin. Chapter 20, verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. Earth and sky fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, 
and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, and each person was judged according to what he had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Got it? 21. Very important. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the th throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Verse 6, It is done. I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give him a drink without cost from the spring of living water. Go to 22. Verse 12, Behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me. Verse 16, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony to the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. <coughs> the spirit and the bride say, Come. And then uh, verse 20, he who testifies to these things say, Yes, I am coming. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. There you have the book of Revelation. Cool. What does it mean, right? This is what guys don't understand today. These are, I'm just going to run through these very, very quickly. Ways to look at it. This view, the preterist view, reads Revelation as having already been fulfilled. It was fulfilled long ago. We need not worry. It all happened in the past. Relax. Okay? Not a very popular view. The historicist view read Revelation as a long chain of events, commencing on Patmos when he wrote it and continuing today. Uh, Martin Luther was a great believer in this. Uh, he saw the papacy, the, the, the priests, uh, the popes, and the high Catholic priesthood as the beasts. Uh, so you can really interpret the, these pictures as anything. Um, mainly focuses uh, on the events of the Western Church, leaves out a lot of events of the Eastern Church. But this view says that history is being fulfilled is fulfilling revelation that um, what is happening in our day is part of the fulfillment of revelation. That's a very popular view. The futurist view um, say that everything in revelation will occur in the future exclusively. That it's not occurring now, but it will occur in the future. Um, and this is a very popular view also. It's a little dangerous because, remember, this book was written to those churches and to the first century. So if it's not happening at all until the future, what value did it have to them? Okay. So then, back to your color printout, very quickly. You have these uh, lines, these charts. I'm going to go through these very quickly. Ideas of how to understand Revelation and how to interpret it. A big item of discussion is that 10,000 uh, years, what we call the millennium. When did it happen? What happens? So if you look right here, see this church age? That's beginning with Christ when the church was formed till today. Okay? The tribulation is what is involved... Uh, you know, we say the seven seals, the seven trumpets, the seven. A lot of people say that all those sevens were just a culmination of tribulation. The millennium is the thousand years that Satan will be bound. And there will be kind of uh, a happy time, peace on earth, whatever you want to say. And then the second coming. The post-millennial view said, believes that the preaching of the gospel will cause people and cause the world 
to gradually become better and better and better until we, you know, we enter this golden age, that Christ will, in, will come after the millennium, okay? And that we will enter eternity together. It was once a popular view. It's not so popular right now. It's become less attractive because is the world becoming better and better and better? No. no. Okay. Uh, amillennialists believe that there is no literal thousand years, that there is no literal reign of Christ on earth, but that Christ's rule today over the church in general is the millennium, is what they believe, that there's no actual thousand years. According to this verse, Satan, according to this view, Satan is kind of a defeated enemy and believers are free to reign with Christ without this evil. Uh, so that in this view, the millennial is not a real number, but a symbolic um, general amount of time where we live with Christ. Um, so the millennial, the church age, and the tribulation are all happening at the same time. And when Christ comes, then we'll all go to eternity. This is the most popular view. Dispensationalists believe that the church age involved first God's work with Israel, then God's work with the church when Christ lived in us today, and then it believes that we will be raptured. The idea of a rapture in Revelation is kind of a new thing. A hundred years ago, two hundred years ago, this idea really didn't wasn't very prevalent, that we would be raptured. And if you read all of Revelation, it's hard to even pick out a verse or set of verses that talk about a rapture. Like we, you know, our idea of that is really popularized by the Left Behind series and uh, other things like that. But if you read specifically, it's hard to pinpoint, um, besides other writings of Paul and everything, an idea that we will be raptured. But this view really holds that, that we will be raptured before the Great Tribulation. We will not be there for that. Then Christ will come, and then there will be a period where Satan will be bound and um, society will be good, and then there will be the Great <coughs> Judgment. You understand that? Okay. Well. The historic is almost identical to it, but there's no rupture. We'll still be here until the second coming of Christ, eternity. Four views. Pick one. Well, I don't want to be yeah, here. but I wonder if anybody ever actually picks one. Well, many do. Many do. And, and I, I think it's it doesn't matter to me what you believe. And it, it's based on what your own your own interpretation of what things are. And my interpretation yes, is I, no weirder than yours or anyone else's yeah. and, because and really, the book itself is weird. Yeah. I really don't like it when people judge other yeah. people's interpretation because no. it doesn't say what it means. So we have to... I do want to say that there is a going too far. Right. There is a going too far. Yeah. If people tell you that, you know, the seven heads are the seven countries that are now da, 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 really think twice because does it really say that no. do you, you know and I'm not saying those people are wrong that could be a possibility but really for yourself and, and really choosing choosing what to believe and, and what how to interpret it does that change your mandate as a Christian no. um, I think this is a a very confusing book, but it's still a wonderful book because of the images of a victorious Christ. Okay, uh, but there is going too far. 